Next up is Dr. Robert Chandler. He is currently the director of the Nicholson School of Communication at the University of Central Florida. He has authored more than 50 um, articles and has co-authored and authored at least eight books. Is eight? Eight. Eight books. Um, and so you guys are in for a real treat. Um, he currently serves on the CBT Board of Directors. And um, so I have had the pleasure of spending the last two days with him. So join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Chandler. Hey. I'm all mic'd up. I probably don't need this. I'm usually loud enough without it. So if it gets too loud, tell me and I'll take it off and uh, won't do this in terms of keeping you awake. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you today, and particularly with the topic that I was invited to address. And um, um, my first reaction is one of a little bit of panic. Uh, we teach both a full undergraduate degree and a master's degree at UCF in this topic. And so I'm thinking, well, they gave me an hour and 15 minutes. This should not be any problem at all to condense two or three years of study down to that. So um, I, I guess I'll talk really, really fast uh, in terms of doing that. But I'm going to try and just go through a number of highlights. This may or may not be what you expect it to be. Um, and um, I hope that it comes out with some usefulness. And I hope it comes out with you to have some practical things about improving your communication. And um, it's certainly not going to focus on how to design a PowerPoint, because I think you can find out those kinds of tips far more easily than something I could do. And, and it, it's really not the best use of my time to come here. Though I can give you PowerPoint tips if you want it. And you can critique mine. That, that's all fair. But that's not really where I'm going with this list today. And so let me just go ahead and get started with it. And uh, we want to talk about effective communication for the business world. And really what the, the topic is grounded in is to understand fundamentally processes of communication. So whether you're talking about superior subordinate communication in the workplace, meetings, teamwork, um, proposals, business presentations, the idea of communicating is probably far more complex than you have assumed at this point. Uh, people will often ask them, what is good communication? They say, well, just transferring information. It's like, well, is it really just that way? The problem with us humans is that we don't transfer information. I mean, unless you're Johnny Mnemonic wired up and we can plug our heads together and move bits of data back and forth, we, I'm up here right now at a very, very physiological level, making noise and, and moving around. You, you understand that, that I'm, I'm, I'm changing my voice, I'm using my lips, my teeth, my tongue, I'm using glottals, I'm using a number of different ways to make noise and sound, and that what I'm actually doing, if you're hearing words right now, if you think those words have meaning, you, you understand where that meaning's coming from, right? It's not coming from me. Your, your brain is organizing these things and deciding that those noises and gestures that I make, sprechen Sie Deutsch? I expect nur ein wenig Deutsch. And uh, I could continue in German for the rest of the presentation, but my guess that would illustrate my point at how much more is like, oh my God. You know, I'm the source of what, what this means. And that should terrify those of us who keep wanting to get our points across. You just don't understand me. And so when I approach the world of communication in the business place and in, in, in the work world, I want you to start with one fundamental paradigmatic shift, which is that it has less to do with what I'm saying and doing, though my noises are important. You know, I'm trying to trigger certain things in your brain. That's my strategy. I'm trying to get you to think. My vocabulary, that's a fun thing to think about for a minute. In fact, ultimately, you're going to discover that all education is vocabulary building. Uh, that's really what it all boils down to. What you started back in first grade with the flashcards and you began to learn vocabulary, when you get to grad school and work on your MBA or whatever you're working towards, it's going to still be vocabulary building. Trying to plan a concept associates with a signal, a term, a word, um, or a particular um, vocalic or whatever it might be. And I think that part of education is expanding our vocabularies of what we can understand and relate to. And, and we do that a number of different ways. And so as we go through this today, if you, if you have a very challenging question or something, feel free to stop me, because I'm, I'm not put off. I've not only been teaching now for 
not going to tell you how many decades. Um, I've also raised three teenagers and I'm married, so there's not much you can say to me that will hurt my ego in any way. I've had, you've had, I've had professional people most of my life that say, oh, come on, Dad, or you know, whatever. So uh, none of that will bother me, so ask a question. So I want to start with, this thing is, is, likes me very much because it's moving forward on its own. Um, let me just start with expanding that basic introductory idea. What is effective communication? Well, in a very real sense, it's creating shared meanings or shared understandings. It's how do I get from what's inside of my cognitive cortex from, a, very specifically, electrical the little tiny electrical firings that are in my brain that I think of as concepts or ideas. And I, I have this self-illusion that there really is something there, but they actually exist very transitory. They're just tiny little sparks, actually. They're micro sparks that are going on in my head that I think of as ideas or points or things I want to get across as I design this presentation. This presentation is all tiny little sparks that are firing in my head. What things can I do? What illustrations can I put on my PowerPoint? What words can I use? What, what gestures? What, what type of dialogue can I use to help create in someone else an understanding of what my little electric, so you have a little electric firings in your head that may approximate mine and that uh, we come away from this. If you're trying to persuade people to a, a proposal, if you're trying to convince people that you're being transparent, if you're trying to do things in order to provide a similar idea, you have to start with a couple of things. Um, at first is perception. All of you probably took an introductory psych class. You've probably got a pretty good introduction to the idea that we perceive the world around us, various stimuli. We make sense of them. You select different stimuli, right? You, 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 hopefully you're focused on me right now. Hopefully you're not focused on the literally hundreds of thousands of other stimuli in this room. Until I call your attention to it. Do you hear the air conditioner humming? Most of you didn't hear that until I stopped and said, let me call your attention to that. You were, you were filtering out because you were trying to hear me and trying to focus on it. The color of the walls, the type of texture that these uh, partition walls have, that little raised velvety texture that they have. The, the, the details, the, the lighting, the, the, the different aspects of it. You have to first perceive things. And, and I know that part of the problem with a lot of communication, one fundamental communication problem is that I didn't hear you. People later will say, well, I, I didn't hear you say that. <laughs> um, uh, I, the idea of, of where we're going with it. And, and by the way, in terms of misunderstandings, you need to understand that all communication is to some degree interpretation. It's not fair to blame someone and say, well, you misinterpreted what I said. Well, in fact, um, it, it, it is what, remember what we did when we first started? It's what that person brings that's going to ultimately decide what they mean. And if you sent an email that you later felt like people just misinterpreted you? <laughs> Emails particularly insidious. We have what we call rich versus lean media. And anytime we communicate via, uh, via media, um, whether it's telephone, radio, um, email, um, instant messaging, Twitter, or Facebook, whatever it is, when you strip away a lot of the richness that we have right now, um, nonverbal, so we'll talk about nonverbals in a second, one of the things that happens is we rely more and more upon the receiver to decide what something means. You lose lots of ways of shaping it. And so that's why email is one of the most misunderstood forms of communication, because we don't get all those wonderful um, little clues and things. To, oh, you were just joking. Oh, your caps lock key was stuck. And the only way you could send the email was in all caps. I just assume that. We, we decide what somebody's doing and, and what, they're, what they're doing with that. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with things. One of the fundamental things you probably learned in psychology that we in communication also recognize is attribution theory. You guys study attribution, you know what fundamental attribution errors are? Are right, you gonna learn something, vocabulary building. Fundamental attribution error is where you attribute all of your own actions to circumstances, to events, constraints, expectation. Well, I had to do that. Other people, oh, I mean, you don't know how tough my... And you attribute everyone else's actions to their internal choices and motivations. So I was in a hurry because people said I had to be somewhere in 10 minutes. You were curt to me and did, uh, treated me with disrespect. Fundamental attribution here. We do it all the time. We also have a self-serving bias, and that comes from attribution theory, that we all tend to perceive things around from our perspective. By the way, there's really no other way for you to do it. We always talk about taking another person's perspective, and I, I do believe in sympathy training and empathy training, and that's all good. But you understand, inherently, you're limited to seeing the world from your perspective. 
I have bad news for you. You are trapped as you. I can't change that. You are you. <laughs> And you've got to see things. And so we tend to see the world. We're here looking out at everything else. You guys, at one level, are just objects in my frame of reference around me. And even if we become close friends, to some degree, that, that idea of I'm in here and you're out there is always there. And so we talk about communication. The other level of communication beyond just realizing it's all interpretive. You know, you, everyone will interpret what you say. Don't get upset. Well, you're interpreting what I Of course they are. The third dimension is meta-communication. Have you heard this word? No, if not another vocabulary building exercise. Meta communication is really communication about communication. And there's multiple levels of it, and I, I may not do all of them today. Um, there's other dimensions of it. At the very least, under, you ever talk about read between the lines? Well, no, you didn't say this, but I knew what you, I, I could tell subtly what you were really getting at there. That's meta communication. And meta communication also has, at least in the Palo Alto group that originally um, studied and researched and published in this area, that communication always has at least two levels. One of them is whatever the substantive issue is. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you came. Thank you for asking that question. It, 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 it's very direct. Matter communication also means that it always says something about the relationship. So I can say, well, that's really a dumb question. On one level, that's a statement that's not a very intellectually stimulating question. On the other level, I just disrespected you. I just, just kind of dissed you, I think, is the term. And uh, the, our relationship maybe didn't go the right way. It, 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 there's, there's different levels of it, and I think that's something to be aware of. And the final one I'm going to mention, just in terms of this, is elaboration. Um, communication, a lot of communication comes at us. My guess is you guys screen stuff out, right? When I first started teaching, I used to talk about junk mail. I don't use that as an example anymore. I now use spam email. I don't even, can't even use that one as much anymore because most of you live in a world with spam email guards, and you don't even understand what the first decade of email was like opening your inbox every day with 4,000 new ads for hair loss replacement therapy, Vi Viagra, and everything else you can imagine. You, you, you've actually been led a very sheltered life. And so a lot of my good examples about being overwhelmed with things you don't relate to. But let me tell you something, that if you tried to respond to every possible thing that was going on around you, try to listen to the air conditioner, listening to me, contemplate the velvety kind of texture on the walls, think about this carpet. Um, think about all of your goals for the day. If you were to really try to engage in every possible thing, at some point you, you'll overload. You start, it all blurs. You know, I just kind of go, uh, back in the 80s we had these paintings you'd stare at. They were called infinity pictures. And you, if you stare at them just right, you'd see a boat in the trees and something would leap out at you. And I, I guess they kind of win as a fad. Only, you got to be old enough to remember a lot of my analogies. But um, part of that is that you, by tuning everything else out, your eyes sort of dilated and you kind of um, lost your focus. You have to keep focused. So one of the things you do is you choose what to elaborate on. One of the tips I give is don't send me an email with uh, 10 main points you want me to take away. I can't take 10 away. I, I, I might take two or three. I might take, actually the suggestion is every email ought to have a point. You don't send an email with 53 main points you want to cover. You send an email with the point that you're trying to make because what you don't want to do is give me the choice to choose which one to elaborate on. That's true in verbal conversation as well. You've got to narrow things down. And so elaboration is just the likelihood that somebody is going to go further with it and explore it. Now, I mentioned a minute ago both meta communication and things um, uh, you know, uh, that relate to the idea of nonverbal communication. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that in face to face settings, more than half of the communicative intention is taken away from various forms of non-orthographic, non-verbal communication. In part, because words are just barking, the noise, you mean, yeah, you, you've got a vocabulary you're trying to assign them. You're using everything that a communicator does to try and understand them. You're trying to catch their demeanor. Um, you know, if I had humor, you'd catch my humor. Um, you, you'd work through this and you begin to say, I see where he's going. It's helping nudge me. So my little electrons are firing and little sparks are firing in a way he's trying to get me to. Um, and, and all of these are very important. Um, that's not to say verbal is not important, because if you took away 35% of it, you'd still have a, a very large gap. Um, we find that of nonverbal, the, the most important ones for someone to come away with meaning that you're seeking have to do with these areas. Uh, facial expression. So I'm, I'm watching your face. 
Uh, I'm watching um, the movements of your face. I'm, I'm trying to get some ideas. By the way, it varies by culture. Western culture, what kind of uh, facial contact are you expecting? Good eye contact, and I have eye contact up there. We'll, we'll lump them together if you want to. If I talk to you like this, Jay, I, just, Jay, I, I need to talk to you about something, and, and, and it's very important, and I really want you to believe me. Now, you didn't see what I did to Jay, so uh, Jay will have to share with you. What did I do? Yeah, I just, but you know, I'm a little adversive. Very well, I may come from an Asian culture, by the way, where eye contact, you ever had anybody do something that's inappropriate? What is it? Too much information. What's the other? You know, somebody say something or do you like? Excuse me. That's too much information. That's not what I need. How about somebody ever ask you something? Well, it's inappropriate. Like, no, no, you're on business. You understand that in many Asian cultures, intense eye contact is a. Um, Yes, it, it's, it's intimate. Let me, let me try and word it this way. It is considered a form of intimacy. So if you come with your mid-America, Texas, I'm going to look you right down the eye kind of thing, uh, in some cultures, it's, it's an assault. Yeah, it's April's guy. It, it's, you know, this idea of, oh my God, you know, what, I'm not that kind of person. Don't, don't, why are you doing this to me? And yet, in that same culture, you have somebody else who's trying to evade eye contact with you. What does your culture tell you about someone who won't look you straight in the eye? Well, then they're deceitful. Now, we already, I'm going to talk about culture clash in a minute, but you understand that communication's about to go horribly wrong here. And you know what's insidious about it is that these differences aren't just between India and Africa and North America. These differences, to some degree or another, are in this room right now. We've got, um, I mentioned haptics. Was haptics on my list? Any of you, there's a whole body of literature on haptics, which is touching behaviors. We can scale people out between high touch and low touch. It's called touch avoidance. You know, Leonard's high touch. How are you doing? You know, and he's on your back in your back, shaking your hand. And, and uh, when he encounters somebody who is touch adversive, which is no. Um, I mean, even, I mean, obviously, if you're meeting someone from Asia and you want a handshake with a, with a what's called, what's the Texas one with the grip? You grab the elbow and the hand and you just kind of uh, up and down on it. You know, the one, every one of you in Western culture had a, a dad or an uncle or a grand, somebody took you aside at some point as a small child and said, this is, this is how you shake hands. Yes, very good, very good. You're from Denver. OK, well, you know, it's a, yeah, that's, a, that's a Colorado handshake. Suppose I shook hands this way, April. Oh, I know, I know. You learn so many things working at so low levels at what things mean. Your brain is putting all this together and you're coming up with meaning about it. And we misunderstand each other completely all the time. There's age differences. Generational differences, guys. There is, there are gender differences. Oh, wait till we talk about that. What do things mean? What do they not mean? There's, um, we'll talk, well, I'll do more about this. Vocalics, I'm, I'm a loud guy. There are, there are people who are quiet. There are people who perceive loudness as having certain meta-communication meanings that others don't. Um, uh, proxemics. Oh, we could do. I could actually do the whole morning just studying proxemics. There's so much. Re you know, proxemics is, is space, personal space, personal bubbles. I, I look around the room at uh, personal space. Um, personal space varies by gender. By the way, who's more space chauvinistic? Who's more space aggressive? Males or females? On average, males are. Um, i trying to think of good examples. Go back to your campuses. I guess nobody goes to the library anymore with the internet. Back in the day, 30 years ago when I used to teach, people went to the library to research. I, this, I know, it's quaint. We had crank cars and um, we had phones that actually had rotary dialing. I, okay, so back in the old days. But if you were to walk into the library, you'd see these nice tables that some librarian had designed that had a nice table with four chairs at them. Now, if you can go back in time with me, back to the day, um, and you walk to the library of a college library, what do you think you'd see? Everybody nicely sitting forward to a table all around? Yeah, and how, what would people do, especially young college age males? Females do it too, but males do it far more dramatically and more um, frequently. Of course they would. Lisa's absolutely right. They'd make sure their books were in front of the chair next to them. If they had a coat on, if you're in the Midwest or the West or you're in the mountains, your coat went over another one. And if you could find some way to push stuff to that diagonal corner, you would do so. 
because our concept of space is varies. You take a group of guys, in, do you still go to the theaters or do you watch everything on your iPads now? Do you still go to the movies? Go to the movies with a bunch of guys and gals from your group. Watch how they take seats. Guys will claim they'll, they'll be expansionistic with their space. Two guys are not going to snuggle in next to each other to watch a movie. No matter how much kung fu is involved in the film, they ain't doing it. In fact, they're going to keep a seat between them as they sit. In fact, they're not done yet. If the, if the theater manager is not watching, what is the next step? They're immediately going to claim even more space. They'll either throw their feet over the chair in front of them, and if they get reprimanded for that, at least you'll notice all their coats and stuff will go and say, like, nobody, this, this is my zone here. You know, don't, don't even. And watch the look on them. Watch them in the quasi-dark if somebody walks in and sits there, in a an empty theater. I love watching. In fact, I, I won't, shouldn't tell you this. I've had my students over the year. We've done a lot of things in elevators and in theaters and things just to get people's reaction. But if you walk someone in in, in a mostly empty theater, you, I've watched the, and they'll get up, they'll go sit over here, and I'll have my students and they'll go get a Coke, they'll go get a Coke, they'll come back and sit right in front of the, oh, it's fun to watch. Space is complicated. Now, so what is the, what's the big deal, Bob? What are you talking about? Isn't this business communication? Absolutely. Have you been in boardrooms or conference rooms? Have you looked at offices? How can you go in and just look at the way space is used and know who's got the most power in an organization? Oh, biggest office? Tell me what else you're going to know about space as a message, guys. Highest floor, Highest floor where it's located? What else? Well, yeah, whether you have real walls or, um, you know, fiberboard, yeah? The window. the window, yes, absolutely. What more expansive space can there possibly be than all of the great outdoors? A window is not just a window for, oh, it's for life, it's for my plants. No, no, window space, guys. A window takes an office and expands it almost infinitely, not quite, but, but almost infinitely in terms of space. Um, if you get a designated parking space as a symbol of status, and if those of you who have been at park competitive places, you'll understand why that's very powerful, very important. Look, it's all about, these are messages. Um, you know, a, a lot of the things that happen communicate things. Um, uh, if you go in many offices, you'll see, uh, where's the best, a uh, best illustration. You guys ever seen the old film, It's a Wonderful Life? All right, so George Bailey goes and meets Old Man Potter, goes to Old Man Potter's office. He said, have a seat here across from my desk. What kind of chair does George Bailey sit in? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not so much that it's wooden or, or, or leather, but... It's it's not just small, but but you know, old man Potter's on in a wheelchair up on a ramp, and the chair that George Bailey sits in makes him slide way down. So even relative space, even in the kinds of things you might think of as metaphors, actually really work in the corporate office. They work in the work world to signal, to mean things. That's why they're so important to some people. All of these are very real. Artifacts. Um, I, I could do, really could do an hour on each of these. I, I, I chose to wear certain clothes. Some of you wore ties today, some of you didn't. You made some choices about that. That's all part of the artifacts of it. If you go into an organization, you're going to find they have their own clothing. Usually you think about clothing as sort of by ethnic culture, right? So, you know, they have wooden shoes there, or um, they all wear berets, or something that's you know, related to culture. The same thing is true in most business situations. There is, there is a certain Costume. I mean, there's a costume. You should conform to the costume. Um, and and oh, well, you told me that might happen. Let's see if I can recover it real quick. You should recover to the costume in terms of doing it. Well, let me. I can come back to this if I need to. I don't, I don't want to do this. I need you to understand that. There are so many levels that we're talking about relationships, understanding each other, um, working together, I mean, collaborating together, trying to do something um, in a team situation. Um, Negative information, ooh, performance appraisal feedback, um, criticism, critique, <laughs> emotional dimensions. There's a lot of different levels where effective communication in the workplace may hinge upon some nonverbal settings, whether we do this in my office, you know. We do space studies. We do whether or not, if you're a manager, do you want to put a chair like the uh, Henry Potter, George Bailey, directly across from you, or do you move it to the side of your desk? Uh, there's actually studies that, that determine that there are people perceive it differently when they pull up beside you to talk to you as opposed to being across that barrier of a desk. Um, do you know that in, in, in the, the Korean War, 
when they started peace negotiations, do you know what the longest part of the peace negotiations were about? They devoted more days, weeks, and months to one issue than anything else. You think of the type of when the date would be for the ending, how do you draw the lines for the armistice? No, the most time was spent in those peace negotiations was on the shape and the configuration of the table for which the negotiations would happen on. They spent more time arguing over round versus triangular versus square versus who gets to sit with the table and who must be at least one chair link back from the table, not at the table. And it was one of the most trickiest parts and the longest intensive parts of it. And I can imagine any workplace with all of the politics, with all of the needs and issues going on, nonverbal communication um, becomes very important. And I, I could do more with this, but uh, I want to move forward with it and um, let's see if I can do this. So what's our orientation to this? If you want to improve how you communicate, uh, I'm going to give you a maxim. Um, and, and this is a, a line here, seek first to understand and seek to be understood. Most of us know this from um, the Stephen Covey books. Um, Covey himself stole it from earlier writers who had stolen it from earlier writers. So um, I have no compunction about using it today. It's been one of the most uh, borrowed phrases um, in communication. But it does capture an orientation. If you walk in and say, I need you to understand me, and that's your orientation, odds are you're facing an uphill battle. You're facing challenges. All right, that makes it very difficult um, to do that. What this idea is suggesting is that maybe rather than, by the way, when I say the word communication, most of you are thinking about, well, you need to make a presentation, you need to persuade, you need to uh, inform. Um, I don't know how many of you did this, and if you did, I applaud you. But you know that more than half of all communication, based upon the fact that receivers decide what things mean, has to do with listening, as it does speaking. Whether I'm successful this morning communicating with you depends somewhat on me. I take my responsibility. It depends far more on your attentiveness, your listening, your willingness to work and get something from this and take it from it. You play a much more powerful role ultimately in whether I communicate it at all than I play, which seems odd at first. But, but nonetheless, it's true from this perspective. If I want to understand, if, if I want to be understood, I need you to understand me. Here are my needs. I think the project should go to Cleveland, not Dallas, and we need to talk about this. I need you to understand me. One of the things this suggests is that you need to first seek to understand. Why do they want the project in Dallas? What are they looking for? What's happening there? What's making them move in this direction? I think that all communication, by the way, today I'm, I'm focusing on communication in the workplace. Let me suggest to you, this works in your relationships. This works at the PTA. This works with your uh, family. Uh, this works with your neighbors when there's an issue about your uh, fence and the tree and, and something's kind of gone wrong there. This works in your mosque or your, your synagogue or your church. This, wor this works. Uh, the same kinds of principles work whether you can get along at work or get along your neighbor or get along in the checkout line at the supermarket. Um, these things are pretty much the same. Um, one is to build trust, which is an important variable to me, and, um, and the idea of building trust and, and, and making yourself trustworthy. Uh, which is a lot of what's been going on here, uh, for me at least, the last two days, is the discussion about trustworthiness. Um, establish your desire to listen and learn. I think you have to have a posture and you have to communicate that I'm open to listening. How, do, how does one communicate they're not really opening to listening? Okay, nonverbal. So we've already used, I fold my arms, you know, I sit back. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's actually an old, um, there's a line that comes from the gender research that said one of the differences between men and women is that uh, women listen attentively. Um, for men, listening is the time you're thinking about what you're going to say next when you get your next chance to speak. And it's a fundamental difference in what listening means. You know, listening just basically means I'm not talking, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next, and uh, as opposed to actually say I'm really trying to be empathetic. Um, and, and part of that is also, you also communicate it by interrupting people. Now here's a classic example. I'll, I keep going back to the gender stuff, but that, that seems to be relevant today. Um, we find a difference between interruptions for men and women. Um, men tend to perceive interruptions as power moves, right? Women more often interrupt men, but they don't see them as power moves. They have things like what's called cooperative overlap. Yes, I understand what you're saying. See, you think, I think I'm being sympathetic. I think I'm being supportive. And at the very moment I say, yes, I understand. They say, why are you interrupting me? 
I need to finish saying what I need to say. And, and so there's, there's some differences there in terms of doing that. But we also can communicate we're not really interested in listening. Um, uh, for you in the business world, one of the things that communicates non-verbally, people perceive it as not listening, whether you really are or not is no longer relevant. What they perceive as not listening is why you're busy taking notes and working on something else while I'm talking to you. So go ahead, tell me what you need. I've got to finish this report. I can hear you. Now, you may be a tremendous multitasker. By the way, there's general differences there, too. You may be a tremendous multitasker, but one of the things that's perceived as, you're not giving this the importance that it's due. Sometimes space and listening, um, I, did, I, I didn't talk about uh, chronemics. Chronemics is another nonverbal, uh, the use of time. What would be a workplace example of the use of time? An agenda comes out for a meeting. You've got an issue that you really have been pushing on. You think it's important. You want them to consider it. And when the agenda is presented to you for the meeting, you notice that it's at the bottom of the agenda and it's allocated three minutes of discussion time. Now, I know it doesn't say this, but tell me how important that item is. Now, you, if you've heard anything I've said so far, you understand it is communicating how important that item is. Oh, no, it's not. No, no, professor. It, it just happened to be, it got put at the end and that everything else had time. That's all that was left. Okay. It will be interpreted and perceived that that's the importance it got. Professors know this from their classes. Stuff we put at the bottom of our syllabi, you know, that last week of things we're going to get to. And then every semester, my God, we've gotten off on discussion and we didn't get back to it again and again and again. And if you guys just read that chapter, we don't have time to talk about it. And then the professors are always upset. Well, they, uh, I, I, just because 50% of the exam was on that last chapter, I told them to read it. And I have students in my office complaining. It's not fair. I assumed it wasn't very important because we didn't get to it. We didn't talk about it. They just quickly, that last day we were running through, they said, go read that. And I actually have this conversation with students in my office every semester. And I have the same conversation with the faculty. And you'd think people would understand. You communicate something with the amount of space and time um, that you devote to it. And people get the point and get the meanings. Well, I didn't intend to. Oh, that's, that's another. Let's, let's, let's put that one aside for a minute. That one works everything from emails to sexual harassment. I didn't intend to. These things have meaning, guys. Right? You, you understand? It, 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 um, it's so naive to think, well, if, if I didn't intend to communicate that, I couldn't have communicated that. That, that is, it's so unsophisticated. I don't know. I'm trying to think what else to call it. It's just, you, you don't understand. In fact, you do. Um, and, and different people have different sensitivities to it. Um, I, I do think it's very important to try, try to get to that level. And uh, I've got to stay on time, too. Uh, I mentioned cultural differences, and, and I, I, do, I do think there's a lot to do with it. Some cultural difference. Those of you who get an international assignment, I've just hired someone that's been spent three years working in India, and we've been talking about this. Sometimes that's a real advantage for cultural differences because it's pretty obvious you can anticipate cultural differences. All right, I've been, I, I spent time in West Africa. I spent time in uh, Togo, um, Yunin, um, 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 didn't go into Ghana, but I was very close, worked with a lot of Ghanaians. Um, and so I knew going to work in West Africa that I was going to encounter cultural differences. It was pretty, boom, boy, I have to be really dumb to miss that. There'd be What's the problem is most of the time cultural differences are the most devastating to communication because we don't assume, we don't presume, we don't suspect that they're going to be existing it. Uh, I was in Canberra last month and doing a presentation for their student exchange students coming to UCF. And so they were coming there. And one of the students said, well, I'm, I'm you know, really rethinking my decision to go to the US. Um, I want to go someplace where there'll be cultural differences. And um, I'm not sure. I'm thinking more of something more you know, diverse. I, I, think, I think being in the US will be just like being in Australia. And of course, I said, well, you can go where you want to go. And you should go where you should go. But um, you, may, you may be surprised to learn that those cultural differences between Australia and the US are, are not only real, but in some ways, they're far more difficult to anticipate and deal with. They leave you far more culturally distressed um, than does the fact you're not getting along quite that well in Bangladesh. Um, and you're finding difficulty there. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's actually there's a list of about 20 of these. I teach a whole course in this topic alone, um, and so I'm just going to give you a couple of, of, of ideas. Um, the, the four big ones that I want to talk about in terms of misunderstanding. By the way, cultural. I, I'm going to finish my original point. Cultural differences include any community membership where you've learned norms. Cultural differences. 
Um, certainly gender is one of them. If you've been genderized in this culture, socialized in the different gender roles, you will understand that there are certain expectations that come with it. Uh, if you have uh, been in any membership in any community, ethnic, religious, um, regionalism in the states, and if you don't think being transferred from Boston to Houston will make a difference to you, <laughs> You've got a lot to experience and enjoy in life because those differences will make a big difference. Um, generational, I already mentioned generational differences. Uh, there, there's so many things here, and the problem is that we don't often recognize those. Um, actually, professional differences. Um, in fact, you will find professions learn to speak their own language and are very comfortable talking to one another. You gather with a group of accountants, and they speak accountantese or, or something. I, as a non-accountant coming and serving on this board, I've learned some days that I just have to let conversations go on because I'm, if you, if you want to, if you want to experience something like that, go visit a major American Medical Association conference and listen to the surgeons talk and argue issues. And, um, or go to, I pick any, I don't care, pick any one of them and you'll discover they speak their own language. So let me give you four of the most common cultural differences, which is group membership differences that we find. High-low context. High-low context has to do with um, the degree to which the verbal part of communication, the degree to which the verbal part of communication is the focused basis for what things mean, and the degree to which the contextual the interpretive process is presumed to be the basis of it. In North America, we're very high verbal orientation. That means we're low context. You've been taught to listen to the words. Words matter. You've been taught that, you know, you know don't jump to conclusions. Uh, you've also been taught don't beat around the bush. Anything sound familiar to your childhood? You know, get to the point. Say what you mean. That's very much a North American Western cultural tradition. You understand many cultural groups, and some even here, non-dominant cultural groups here, believe that that's offensive. And in fact, they would suggest to you the burden is upon the listener to figure out what it means. When I teach a class to North American students and they do bad on a test and they all show up at my door, the theme, stated different ways, the theme is ultimately you did a piss poor job teaching. It's your fault I scored low on this exam. You could have explained this better. You could have given us more time. You could have chosen more realistic deadlines. You could have um, done the assignment rubric differently. I hear a lot of that. When a student fails an exam, they come in and say, this was a horrible exam. That's a very North American kind of, um, you know, in terms of um, what it is. When a, one of my, I've taught Japanese students for a number of years, which are completely, I actually taught combined classes of American and Japanese students, which I have many stories to share with you. But one of the things there is that they would come in and say, you know, I have failed this exam. The, the idea being that they would never blame me in terms of doing it because it was their responsibility to learn the material. It was their responsibility to understand it. I would be going along in a lecture, and if I used I, vocabulary, it's all about vocabulary, I use a vocabulary word that my class is not familiar with, my American students are like, eh, what the hell? I have no idea what he's talking about. And they'll just go around and keep on with their notes. You'd think at least one of them excuse me, you used a term, and I, could you just define that term, and, and I want to be able to use it correctly, which would be the appropriate thing to do, but also kind of an embarrassing thing with your classmates and everybody else, so you just stay quiet and say, yeah, I, I can live without it. You know. My Japanese students, I always knew I used that word because when you have a room half full of Japanese students, at instantly when you use one of those words, exactly one half of the room's Japanese English dictionaries flip open, and they're people are going through there to find the word out. Um, you know, and, and my, my Japanese students after an exam would come into me and begin by apologizing for failing a test, which is amazing. You know, I'm sorry that I have basically, not only, I've embarrassed myself, I've embarrassed you, I've embarrassed my classmates by failing this. They don't come in with me, you obviously wrote a bad exam. High context is where the meaning for things is expected to be derived by the recipient of the communication. The burden is on them. They would never say you weren't clear. They would never interrupt someone at a business meeting and say, you just weren't clear with that proposal. In fact, that would actually be considered very embarrassing and insulting. They would say, we failed to understand what your proposal was. I don't know if you catch that subtle change in, in context. 
Um, there's a film I used to show my students, and it was of a Japanese couple at breakfast, and uh, they would, it was an old film, and way back in the day, but uh, um, I think it was black and white, which I know you guys have never seen media like that, but anyway, way back in the day. And um, this, this couple would get up in the morning and have breakfast, and by the way, not a single word was spoken. They came in and in very traditional old Japanese scene, and the 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 male lead, the husband character in this would open up his newspaper and would kind of rustle the newspaper a little bit, and you'd watch the Japanese wife hop up and run over and come back with coffee, and he would <laughs> clear his throat and she'd run over and bring his breakfast over, bring his miso soup over to him, and and it was this thing. And I'd ask my students to debrief it, and they go, well, nothing was said. She just seemed to volunteer to do all this, and then we'd go back through it and we'd see that there was a certain pace and order and expectation that was there, and it was it was her job to figure out what he wanted when. He never felt any compunction to say, I'd like some miso soup. He certainly never thought about going and getting any miso soup himself, didn't occur to him. And, and it has to do with the context of it. And well, you know context, probably the best example for you is sarcasm. Surely you practice sarcasm in your generation. All right. Sarcasm is a high context. Sarcasm is a high context form of communication because it actually undercuts the actual verbal piece, right? You know, the, you may say good morning, but you really mean you're four hours late and, and what, you know, you're mentally deficient or something. You know, that's what it means, but it's very sarcastic um, in terms of doing it. High context cultures have to deal with that. Well, obviously, when you put two people together, one is an indirect, ambiguous, high context, you know, you should figure this out. I should not have to go, I should stoop myself um, to explain it, and you put high verbal. Let's say what you mean. Just spit it out, right? I love that. Just spit it out. Just spit out. You're going to have misunderstandings. Much like the eye contact example I used with Jay earlier, um, it's also true in terms of language use. So if you have North American and uh, some Asian cultures that have high context commitments, the Americans are very, let's just say, what, what are you going to do and what, what, when is it going to happen? If you can't do it, just tell me no. And one of their frustrations is a lot of Asian cultures will simply feel embarrassed to say no, like you can't figure out that we can't do this. I had my good friend, Tadasu Imahori, who taught in Japan and just passed away two years ago and, 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 um, uh, with a surprise heart attack. Um, not surprise for Japanese culture. It's, it's far too endemic there. But um, Tadasu used to talk about how the fact among Japanese talking about North Americans would just talk about how unsophisticated they were. That was the way they understood this. That the reason you want to be so blunt and direct, they consider it clumsy and, and unsophisticated. They consider themselves far more sophisticated, like we can kind of figure out what's going on here. And, but you Americans, you're like, here's an example. If you ever had somebody asking out on a date and you really don't want to go with them, and so what did you do? You didn't tell them, no, you moron, I, I don't want to go out on a date with you. Um, what did you do? Well, you, yeah, you dropped hints. You, um, for six nights in a row, you were washing your hair and couldn't go out. You know, you did, you had some, and, and what did you think of the guy, or gal, here, who kept calling on the seventh night, going, well, can we go out tonight? Stupid. Um, like, don't you, you moron. I mean, read between the lines, you know. It's interesting, that same feeling that you have in that instance was what my Japanese counterpoints would have about our entire culture sometimes. Like, you, and people, oh, well, that's racism, and, and maybe it is, but it was, it was an idea of they thought, you guys don't get it. Yeah, how can you think you're going to play on a world stage when you can't even take a very obvious hint? Anyway, but context is a big difference. We talked about sender-receiver. I'm going to skip through that. Expectation violations. Um, all of us bring certain expectations. You brought expectations this morning, right? I wasn't here when you first got here, but all of you apparently came in and took seats. Nobody rearranged the furniture. You, you, you know, you, your expectation wasn't that you needed to sit, stand until told to sit. You bring certain expect. you understand, you package those and you bring them with you, you import them to this situation. Somebody ask, how would you ask me a question if you had a question right in the middle of my presentation? Raise your hand. That's an interesting thing. And you would raise your hand and, and, and the expectation would be, I would call upon you. And um, it, it's a way of getting, well, why would you raise your hand again? It's, it's a little awkward. In fact, if you do this for a few minutes, you begin to feel really awkward with doing this. I'm experiencing that right at this moment. Why, 
Why not raise your foot? It's nasty. <laughs> Never mind. I, I have no idea where you're going with that. We're going to stop right now. Um, where did you, did you get a memo with this conference that we would be to get attention and called upon in a session, you would raise your hand? And does it matter your left or your right hand? No, it doesn't matter. Okay, you know the rules at least. I didn't get that. Was that supposed to be in my, my package of stuff? Jim, was I supposed to have some announcement about how we would get recognized? No, but all of you are looking very knowing. They're like, well, God, this is dumb. Of course, you just raise your hand. Why? You were acculturated with it, it became an expectation, and you now take it for granted and everything else. When you're at a business meeting, somebody raises, you, you don't, you don't, I mean, try that the next time, say, excuse me, why is your hand up in the air? <laughs> are, are you having physical discomfort? <laughs> are you having muscular spasms? Uh, you can't control that? And they'll say, what are you talking about? I just wanted to ask a question. Oh, wait, well then you can use this to say, wait a minute, segue into the fact you make lots of assumptions. You understand it's not just hand raising. You bring all kinds of presumptions and assumptions, we call them expectations about what things mean, what things don't mean. That's, that's one humorous example, but you have, you have hundreds of them, um, much like where you sat. If I, if I, if I teach you one of my classes, and we teach on this topic for a whole unit, I'll do different things in different class periods, and my class learns to just completely drop expectations. Um, I've come in and taught class, I've pulled up a chair, I've taught classes from a seat, I've, I've gone to the back of the room, made everybody turn around and say, but the projector's here and why are you over, I don't, I'm, I, I'm very confused, What's, this is awful. And then you watch people physically, this is like the guy in the movie theater, we have somebody sit in front of him, like, you know, this is just really just outrageous, I'm, I, I can't take this anymore. Um, uh, the, the, there's so many levels of expectation, there, there's levels of, of, of doing this. And, and the problem is with a lot of times, our expectations get violated. Um, our use of nonverbals. I mentioned high touch versus low touch. The same thing is true in terms of, um, what's the old Seinfeld one, the close talkers? Yeah, OK. I mean, there are these expectations. And, and in fact, Seinfeld's a wonderful illustration if you teach a course in this, because they got an episode on every one of the things I'm talking about. They make fun of it. But oh, okay, I never thought about that. I guess we do make assumptions. And of course, George stands as rules about, oh, well, you know, that's, it's, it's the fourth date. Therefore, these things are the rules that are in play. And now you violated this rule. They, make fun, they made a whole humorous career out of a reality, which is we all import these expectations and we very rarely question them. The problems happen when expectations get violated. I was in, um, actually I was in Lomé, Togo, um, Domoke Day, uh, who was a friend of mine, and um, um, about, I don't know, he was about 15, 20 years my junior, who was my host, and we had gone, uh, traveled up country in, in West Africa, and we'd done some things together. We'd gone to Lomé, and I don't know if you've been to an African city. Um, uh, Lomé is, it may not be typical of all of them, but Lomé is, no one follows traffic guidelines. So there's, no, there's painted lanes, no one cares. If there's stoplights, no one cares. It's who's quick and who's got a horn, and um, you know, and, and so we were gonna cross this main boulevard, and, um, and I was, you know, a little apprehensive, and, and, and uh, so Adamake, using actually an African hospitality concept, which is he was responsible for me. If this dumb American got killed there, he'd feel bad about it. And uh, um, so right before we went to walk across this boulevard, he reached out and held my hand. And we crossed the boulevard. Now, I don't know where you're from. <laughs> But in my world, my very limited, sheltered, naive world, not many guys had reached out and held my hand as we crossed the street before. We tried that today. When you guys leave this room, I want a couple of you just to take their hand and walk out to the, to the lunch area together. But let me tell you, when it first happens to you unexpectedly, a lot of stuff goes through your mind. It's like, this is different. Um, am I going to have to buy him dinner? I don't know. What, 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 what do you do with this? How do you reciprocate? With it? Now, in his worldview, he was looking out for, a, <laughs> for an idiot American who probably got run over and where traffic is coming from every possible direction. There's no traffic signals, and there were people out there dodging it. And by the way, they have a horrible mortality rate. People do die trying to cross these streets with people whizzing by. And the, the problem was my expectations for what is appropriate conduct were completely violated. I got to turn me down. I knew I was too loud. 
Um, my expectations for appropriate conduct were violated, which created lots of communication issues. It created assumptions, presumptions. It could be very disruptive. The, I lived for a year in Florence, Italy, and Florence is marvelous. And one of the things I, as a um, um, North American, became accustomed to is the double kiss greeting. It was different for me, all right? It, I wasn't accustomed to it. Some of you are far more sophisticated. You can handle all this with no problem. And it was new to me. And it's like, do you go left? Do you go right? Wait, how do you do this? You know, and I'm bumping my head against I, I wasn't sure of all of the different parts of the ritual and how it worked. And um, it, it was an expectation. Sometimes expectation violations are, 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 are not that dramatic. They're very subtle. People leave upset over something, and somebody else goes, why? In fact, I've actually, we've actually studied encounters doing field research where Two people both left upset because the other person was um, rude and audacious. And they themselves saw themselves as them being very honorable and gone overboard. Let me give you an international example. I took my students. We went to a restaurant in uh, Germany. All right? And have you been to Germany? Um, we went and studied um, McDonald's restaurants because for my students, McDonald's felt very comfortable. They'd all grown up playing the balls and the Happy Meal and riding the slide. And Ronald McDonald was like their babysitter. So, I mean, it was a... They were very comfortable with it. And we'd go to McDonald's where they thought they knew the rules. And I would make them go in and I'd have them do different things and we'd come back and debrief later. But let me tell you a, a typical story about this. So my North American goes through and they order their um, you know, mackerel with cheese and uh, they get it with palm frits. And if they're in Germany, you can get it with a glass of beer. So they're like, oh, this is so cool. This is it. McDonald's sells beer. This is so cool. And so they, 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 they bring their, their plastic tray back and um, um, they look around the room uh, for seating. Now, we did study after study after study. What we found when my college students looked at a room, and let's say you, I, wish, I need a, a whiteboard, I guess I don't have one, but typically the McDonald's would have these plastic little tables with four little swivel chairs around them. Um, actually, McDonald's has done some research and has changed them in the decades since we did this study. I'll tell you how in a minute. Um, and I would have my students look in the room. Now, if you had a room, let's just say hypothetically there were 100 seats, because that's a round number, and I'm not an accountant, so it's easier for me to illustrate this. You had 100 seats in this. And um, of those, you had um, you know, 25 little tables of four swivel seats. All right? If you looked around the room, and if you saw that every one of those little tables had one person sitting at them, my North American college students would consistently, at a statistically significant level, check the box that says the restaurant seating is full. I would point out to them, three quarters of the seats in the restaurant were vacant. No one was sitting in them. And they say, yeah, but, and what would they say to me? But the tables all had somebody at them. The tables all had someone at them. Therefore, you couldn't sit there. It was occupied, much like the library example I gave you earlier. It was, it was occupied. When my um, Japanese and my German and my Austrian, actually they're Austrian students, were asked the same thing, they would pretty consistently tell me that there are 75% of the seats, 75 seats are vacant. They could sit anywhere they wanted. And the Americans would argue with them, no, but you can't. It's not right. They're only there. And the idea of territoriality and space and expectations with, with it. So then the next stage of the experiments is I would have a couple of things happen. One is we would find tourists and, and different people um, who were there, mostly Americans. And if, why in the world you travel to Germany and go eat at McDonald's is beyond me. That's a, that's a different lesson I, I really have to raise with, with your generation. But there they were. They were eating their, their, their McRoyal with cheese. And while they sat there, I would have my students go sit with them, go join them at one of these tables, sit across from them. I used to love having them do that and watch their reactions. And then I would have a lot of my other students go sit with other Europeans, particularly my American students would sit with them. So um, here you are, you're, you're sitting there eating your McRoyal with cheese, your palm frits, and sipping your beer, and you're having a lovely day in Munich, and why you're eating McDonald's is just brain death. And so there you are, and this nice German comes in and sits down opposite of you. Tell me, which a preponderance, an overwhelming preponderance of my students, Verify this is the most common reaction. Tell me what your first thought is. Yeah. No, no, you're, you're right on. You're, you're right on. And it's like, I was here. What are you doing here? 
They saw it as aggressive. They, they rated it as highly aggressive. The second most common thought that was given right after that initial one, the, 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 the follow-up, the sequential thought was, all right, I'm going to be calm. I'm, 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 a, I'm a college, I'm soon to be college-educated person. I, I'm sophisticated. And I'm not going to overreact. All right? I, I'm in control here. And I'm going to show them that even though these people are horribly rude and aggressive, I'm going to show them that we're not. We're good people. And then they proceeded to do what? No, they didn't leave. Absolutely, who said no? No, no. What they what they do? They spoke to them. At that moment, with all the debriefings that we did, the Germans, who had been perfectly oblivious to the American up to that point, not paid any attention to them, were busy eating their own lunch, suddenly were completely shocked at the aggressiveness, the rudeness, and the evasiveness of the North Americans sitting there. Because for them, sitting across the table was not a violation of personal space. Speaking to me? Excuse me? Was. So they immediately, by the way, we debriefed a lot of people, immediately started thinking, well, these Americans are uncouth, they're un un uncivilized, they're, they're impolite, but you know what? We Europeans are smarter than them, and we are more hospitable, and we are more polite. So you know what? I'm not going to tell this person what sh they should be told. I'm going to be nice, I'm going to smile, I'm going to try and speak to them, and maybe they'll shut up. But they are rude and aggressive. They're not like us. They're not polite and well-behaved like us. Well, typically what would happen, I'll go through the end of the story. What would happen with most of the North Americans we put through these experiments, most of them would end up self-disclosing and telling their life stories to a stranger they just met at a McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I'm a... My dad's an alcoholic, and you know, mom's got this disease, but I decided to come to Europe anyway, and here's what I'm doing, and uh, you know, last night we had this great party. Let me tell you about this party. And they would end up disclosing everything about them, you know, say, here's my email, why don't you, you know, by the way, here's my phone number, if you're in the States, look me up the next time you're in Idaho, uh, you know, I'll just come on by and come. And uh, we would, when they left, what was interesting about these episodes we studied, when they left each other, both of them felt they had been polite, they had been the superior person, showed their, their, higher, their higher moral position, and the other person was just rude, brutish, uncivilized, and impolite. Let me tell you something about expectations violations. We, I, we've done studies in all sorts of contexts. You can leave a business meeting convinced that you, were, you held the high ground, you were so good about it. They were so rude and arrogant and pushy and I don't care what word you want to put in whatever business meeting you've had. The reality is that because of expectations violations, you can have a complete meltdown and really both misperceive what is or isn't happening. You have to really see through the situation and question expectations. You must become aware of your expectations. One of the reasons, by the way, I like to send students abroad to study is not what you put on the applications. All of you write on your study abroad applications, I want to learn about other cultures. Well, that's nice. But let me tell you what you should be putting on those applications. I want to figure out my own damn culture. Because I assure you, one of the things you will do in a study abroad situation, I've done it when I lived in Korea, I've done it when I lived in Russia, I've done it when I lived in West Africa, and, and the three times I've lived in Europe, I learn more about me <laughs> and my assumptions and things I just took for granted. I become far more aware of the expectations I have, and I understand now why the person in the grocery store line that jumped in front of me so upset me and why that was such a big issue because I've been thrown elbows by little old ladies in buses in Salzburg who um, are going to make sure they get on a bus, you know, and I've seen the different assumptions and, and yes, I know the Italians can't form a queue and I lived in Italy for a year and I got lots of Italian stories for you, but at least I began to understand why that upsets me. What is it about my order? What is it about my kindergarten timeout period where we brought our blankets and laid there and slept and we ate those silly cookies and drank the little punch? And, and what did I learn in kindergarten that's affecting me now why I can't get along in an international situation or work with my coworker from India or I'm having conflict and I'm having disputes and I, I need to move on? Uh, rules violations. I, I'm not going to do a lot on rules. Basically, rules, um, we all learn a set of rules, turn-taking rules, for example. Um, rules for raising your hand, rules for when you assemble, rules for punctuality, um, rules for, um, actually lots of rules, rules for cleanliness and, and whether you should bathe daily. And by the way, when you violate rules, um, there's usually repercussions. A lot of communication misunderstandings come because people have learned different rules. 
and that's related to expectation violation. Let me, let me move forward. Um, if you want to improve your communication, there's a couple of things let me leave you with today. One is you've got to focus on explanation and feedback. This is by focusing on the receivers, that you need to explain to them why you're doing what you're doing or, or what you're asking for or why you're asking for something. I think, I think requests or commands all need to come with some sense of rationale. I'm not sure it works anymore. I'm the boss, that's why. I, I, I don't think that's effective communication. It doesn't lead to communication satisfaction. It has further misunderstandings. And usually, if you don't provide the rationale, guess what? They will. I know I wasn't supposed to talk about rumors today, but I, we do a whole separate thing on rumors and misinformation in the workplace. And, and by you failing to provide rationales and justification, they'll create one. Um, I mentioned listening earlier. I'm not going to redo it again. Um, but obviously, more than 50% of effective communication involves um, effective um, uh, listening. Um, active listening, where you, you actually get engaged. This is really tough for uh, masculine and feminine um, differences, too, because I think we're acculturated to listen differently. Um, and of course, question asking, which is something that we're reticent about in terms of doing. I think um, you also have to balance your, your task and relationship focus in the workplace. Uh, I'm not going to get on a lot of theory here, but basically the, the polls here are focused on getting the job done, focus on dealing with people, relationships. Um, whether you're asking someone to do something or you're telling them to do it. And there's a lot of studies that suggest that what you have to do is keep these in play recognize these four dimensions, whether you're the driver, you're the expressive person, you're the amenable person, or the analytical person. One thing I'll tell you, there is no one best style. What we have learned over research after research study is that your choice of style and approach must fit the needs of the communication situation. That means there are times when it is not only appropriate, but most effective for you to be a driver. Oh, we got to get this done. 3 o'clock is the deadline today, guys. We can talk more about your problems and other things at some other time. Right now, get it done. Let's make the 3 o'clock deadline. Otherwise, we miss our SEC filings. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. There are other times where it's like, you know what? We, we need to back off. I need, I need to ask you to do this, but I, I'm really concerned about your workload. I'm concerned about we've asked you to do 12 things. All of them do it at 3 o'clock. And we, let's, let's figure out what the priorities are. What do you think? So there are different places for it. And this is probably a simple little way to keep that balance. And I'm not going to go through all this. You can find a lot of this communication style uh, literature available. You can find good sources of it. But try to find your style and try to balance your approach in terms of how you're interacting together. Um, participation is very important with communication, and particularly in the workplace. Um, even if you don't adopt a participatory management style or management by walking around, participation, allowing people to feel that they're part of the process, they have input, they have say-so, is critically important to motivation, commitment to performance, morale, and satisfaction. Motivation, commitment to performance, morale, and satisfaction. Note I didn't say performance. That's one I cannot link it to in a, in a study. But I can link it and prove to you it's highly correlated with the other four variables. When you allow them to participate in, I think, a couple of very quick takeaway points, I think you need to adopt a dialogic versus a monologic style. Do you, do you, do you recognize those words? I'm doing my vocabulary building. What would dialogic style be? OK, yeah, no, that's very good. But one more, one, like a dialogue, right? So that we are having a conversation. Monologic style is, I'm here to talk. You're here to listen. By the way, there is a, which, which, which tends to be more monologic and dialogic, masculine? Feminine style. Yeah, masculine tends to be more monologic. You know, I'm talking, you know, and uh, you're here to hear me. That's why they tell more jokes, stories. There's a lot of things that come from this. why they don't like to ask for directions. I mean, there's a lot of things that come from that. Dialogic style has more to do with the given interplay of the relationships. Um, by the way, ethical communication in the workplace often comes down to this. There's several really important business ethics um, and business communication ethics um, approaches which say really ultimately if you engage in dialogue in the workplace, it moves towards more ethical interaction as opposed to monologic, the way you treat people and those kinds of things. Um, Supportive, um, supportive versus defensive. Uh, even when you handle difficult information, I think handling bad news is one of them here. Solution oriented, uh, be open minded rather than authoritarian or autocratic. These should be self evident, I hope so. Transparency and, of course, ethical dimensions. By the way, style is a choice. I know we all learn styles, and I understand that. What you can do, much like when I talk about going abroad and learning about my culture, you too can learn about your own style, critique it, and maybe even work to change it. So, you know what? I need to handle these things differently. I don't need to. 
I don't need, I think I'm being witty, but everyone else in the room sees me as being a jackass. I mean, you need to begin to see there's a difference. You know, I'm just being funny. They can take it. They're tough. Yeah, back off a little bit here. Maybe there's a thing here. Remember, you don't have to intend to be communicating that in order to be communicating that. So you've got to pull aside somebody who says, I know you think you're being really witty when you make those smart-ass comments, but um, can I just, can we have a talk? Here, here's, what, here's what we think. You know, and those are tough conversations to have, but those are important conversations to have. Uh, conflict, I was just going to talk a little about conflict. Let's just do a couple of takeaways. Don't try to avoid conflict. Conflict is inevitable, and, and it can be very, very useful. I think disagreements are great. I'm a big fan of debate, of, of disagreement. I think, I think you ought to sometimes even try to foster it if you're not having any. I think it's dangerous if you never have. Oh, that's, you know, y'all just kind of like sheep go along, whatever you say, that's what we'll do, thank you, you know. No, you need to have somebody question stuff, challenge assumptions, um, um, and explore the thinking process behind it. There's nothing wrong with it, but you don't have to do it in a verbally aggressive or a mean-spirited way. In fact, as long as you're focusing on the issues, you can have any debate that you want. And by debate, I don't mean you get into a, um, um, you play in the dozens. You know, you don't play in the dozens as what you guys, uh, it's, um, it's a, a street form of insults where you have to go back and forth and insult um, people back and you have to raise the stakes, you know, and then you cross the, you know, you get into the mama jokes and stuff and it gets really sensitive. You have to be careful. Uh, conflict can energize, but it can also be dysfunctional. And recognize the patterns of conflict and anticipate and overcome them. Um, all of you have done like Thomas Kilman work. Have you, have you assessed yourself? Um, you might want to get a copy of the Thomas Kilman instrument and get some assessment. I have a critique of Thomas Kilman. He's, um, first of all, he stole everything from Blake and Mouton's work and doesn't acknowledge it. Secondly, I think it's um, culturally biased. And third, I think there's a gender problem with it. But if you, you can still get some value out of using Thomas Kilman's work. And uh, of course, he lets you decide what style you have. By the way, it's all said and done which of the five styles is the least effective and which is the most effective according to the Thomas Kilman work. Compromise is the, which one did you tag it with, least or most effective? Yeah, uh, Kilman says it's the least effective. Uh, says you should never try to compromise. That compromise leaves everybody halfway dissatisfied. It leads to uh, half-assed solutions. He is far more of a collaborating, win-win, find a way so everybody gets everything, figure out how to get the maximize from it. Um, and anyway, that's a good reading. The literature's there. I don't need to do all this. If you're interested, find that. Remember my three critiques or email me if you're like, what were your critiques again of that? Uh, meetings, you know, running effective meetings is one of the most best things you can do in the workplace in terms of business communication because it is often the number one mentioned source of dissent. I hate meetings. Another meeting. Unbelievable. Um, you can do things to make meetings. Uh, meetings have, the research indicates good, well-run, effective meetings are marvelous. We have all kinds of outcome variables that are correlated with effectively run meetings, but you have to plan for them. You have to make them happen. Um, you can um, improve performance. You can get, we have productivity gains, morale gains, uh, better decision making. There's oh, such a great literature review. Uh, I could make a great case in defense of meetings. If you have fun, we should never have a meeting again. That's a question I love to get. It's like, really? Well, here's the things you lose. Boom, 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 and we talk about it. Um, to run an effective meeting, never come to a meeting without a purpose and objectives for the meeting. And if you have to, do what I said earlier, provide a rationale and explanation. Here's why we're meeting. All right? Then you provide useful and vital information at the meeting. Do not just drone on. Don't just swamp people. Do something that I'm actually learning. I do believe advanced work is very important for it. Uh, meetings have to be uh, interesting, and they need to um, have a frame and an agenda. By the way, that communicates something. We already covered that. Uh, but, uh, but what it communicates is very important. And I'm, I'm not going to cut it short of time, so uh, I've got some other things about improving meetings, but let me jump down. Um, I do think you should have, any meeting should end up with a follow-up plan. I always am suspect of a meeting that doesn't end up with a very specific follow-up plan that specifies who's doing what, when we will get back from it. Um, I actually have suggested different checklists and that people get a copy of the follow-up plan and they agree an agreement about what constitutes fulfillment of it. Oh, well, I thought all you wanted from me was a name. I didn't realize you wanted um, a rationale or something else. Be very clear with it. Um, most effective meetings get immediate minutes that follow up. Uh, you follow up with the people for, who are responsible for action items. You hold people accountable, and you spend some time debriefing the meeting. Meeting planners should always debrief a meeting. What went well? What didn't? What did we do wrong? How could we have better prepared? 
Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot on business presentations I normally talk about on this topic. Um, let me just, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you three takeaways. Any of you guys like being right about stuff? You like being right? I'm going to tell you three things, three most common business presentation mistakes. First of all, what does the word ology mean? The study of, exactly. So if you put it in front of the Greek word for life, bio, you get study of life, biology. So if you're going to study societies, uh, sociology. When you conduct a study or you conduct a project, you use, and by the way, if you do academic, if you write a thesis, write a dissertation, you will use a method for doing that. When you make a business presentation and you say, here is my method, you are correct at describing it. If you say, here is my methodology, tell me what you have just literally said you're presenting. The study of methods. One of the most frequently ignorant words used in the workplace is when someone stands up and says, here's my methodology. Unless they're about to analyze a number of methods, which is what we do in our research methods class, we study methods, statistical methods, they have simply proved themselves either completely ignorant of Greek and Greek sophistics, or they have not thought about what they're saying. Yet, I hear this over and over in business presentations, and I sit in the back of the room and I cringe. I'm like, go to school. Learn something. Um, and I find other people say, well, if they use the word, maybe I should use it too. Well, let me tell you what your mom, well, your mom probably told you this already, but if you go along with what everybody else is doing, then, well, yeah, bad things happen. The second most common thing, um, is it has to do with someone gives a business presentation and they talk about going up and taking the podium. Podium, which comes from the same root word as podiatrist and podiatry, by the way, means what? Feet. It does mean feet. What's a podium? Podium is a riser or lectern on which you stand. A band director steps, there's no rise here, but steps up on a podium. If there's a platform, you're going to take the podium. If you walk up and stand behind a lectern, or pulpit, or some other words for it that are appropriate, you are not taking the podium unless you're also up on a stage. And I find that to be the second most common business ignorance about uh, in a communication situation. If someone says, well, get there behind the podium. You can't get behind something unless you put your feet on top of it. Podium, feet. The third most common mistake, you like being right. I mean, you're going to use these. You're going to be in a meeting pretty soon. You say, you know, by the way, um, I learned something. I actually learned something the student leadership conference I went to, and you're using that word wrong. It's great for if you're ever in cash cab. Um, <laughs> the, the important, the, the third most common thing is that anytime you talk about human beings and interaction, whether it's reading, writing, speaking, human beings engage in communication. The word communication with the S at the end refers specifically and exclusively, as in telecommunications, to technologies. So if I have two computers plugged in together, there is communications. If I have, ra I'm worried about radios. Are the radios working? That's communications. But any time that you're talking about human beings, even if they're using technology, we're exchanging emails, we're communicating, that, that is human communication, it is mediated, it's mediated communication. But one of the, the third one I'll give you as a freebie today is that the word communication, if it occurs with an S, should appropriately refer to something like you know, our telecommunications data center. Perfectly legitimate use of the word. But if it involves people trying to understand other people, you're talking about the process of communication. All right, three giveaways, that's it. I won't do more on my presentations um, in terms of doing it. Um, we can talk about attention giving. I can't do a handstand, but to those of you who could, you know, it's, um, it's however, however, however you want to interact with us together. Um, uh, I do think you need to know what you're talking about. You should have some experience. Uh, I don't like people who um, get an article off of the internet and come in and say, I'm an expert today and talk to you about communication. That, that bothers me. I, I'd rather have somebody who's struggled with it and studied it um, in, in terms of getting around with it. And of course, all we're trying to do is improve human interaction, our understanding of each other, and what prevents that, what creates misunderstandings and conflicts and disputes and disagreements, and to allow us to share and treat one another in a way that advances our tasks and goals and relationships. And that's basically telling them what you're about to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them um, is a basic format. Um, preview, 
presentation, review, done, uh, in terms of getting out of there. Give them something of value. Never allow a group that you're speaking to in a, in a business presentation not leave by understanding they've at least learned something new, they've seen some insight, they've, they've heard something. If all you've done is regurgitate what they already know, then, then you really have to question why you're giving that presentation. Uh, I have these slides on here with difficult conversations. That's probably my most common question that I get, and I'm just about out of time here, so I'll, I'll just have to wait if you want to do that. Um, be direct. If you have to deliver bad news, deliver it face to face. Uh, good news you can send via email. Uh, email is horrible for bad news. Please don't um, discipline someone, reduce their pay, lay them off, um, furlough them via an email or something. You want to do that face to face. Um, you certainly don't want to give them negative information like, you know, we, I'm giving you a negative performance review and I'd rather not see you. I just want to kind of send it to you. you. You need to talk to people and give them a chance and be able to listen to them in terms of doing it. Um, and that's successful conversation. I, I know I've only got 19 seconds or so left on my watch. I mean, it, it's not a lot of time for questions here. I know you're all hungry for lunch, but do, do you have any questions for me? I'd be happy to engage anything that's crossed your mind in the last hour. Sure. She's bringing your microphone, too. They took mine away. You could have mine, but it's off. It's not off. Hello. When you're uh, trying to listen to someone um, and you feel something might have gone somewhere in the conversation and you part ways, um, how, at what point do you analyze and cross the boundary of overanalyzing? Like, are you just supposed to, like, just what would your advice be just stop listening or not worry about it at a certain point or try thinking about it and understanding let me I'm gonna give you a um, academic answer but I, I think it's the honest one we, we use what we call principle diminishing returns all right and principle diminishing returns says as long as you're analyzing what happened and you're still like okay that's I seen that now I didn't I, I didn't get that at first oh wait a minute I see where that could have been taken the wrong way. As long as you are thinking about this and you're still having a return, you're still saying, you know what, I know to do this better, I'm going to handle it differently next time, that's, a, to me, a legitimate post-interaction analysis and I think it's good reflection and I think it's good practice. If after day seven and you're saying, oh, I could have done that, wait, that's what I thought on the first day. You, your analysis of it, you're worrying about it, you're, 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 you're critiquing it, is no longer producing any new insights, and it's a, then you're just worrying. Then, then, you've, then you've gone on too long and too far, and you need to move on. So it's the principle of diminishing returns, and that works for a lot of things. You should keep doing just to be, how often do I try to explain to someone they're not getting it? Well, you know, if even if you're making some progress, maybe try to explain it again. But at the point where three times and it's not changed, and they still don't even, you know, then quit, move on. Uh, I mean, I, th I think the principle of diminishing returns is probably a very good one for, for a lot of different applications in life, and I think it certainly works in that one. Other questions? They're pointing over here. Whose hand was it? Yeah, is it Kyle? Regarding uh, balance, balancing the task and relationship yeah. communication, I know that a lot of us are dealing with peers rather than I guess subordinates yeah. in that sense. So where do you see that balance on the people and task and the ask and tell? What do you feel like would be the most effective way to communicate in those kind of situations? Well, I do believe in style flex. I think, I think you have to assess the people. You have to read where they are. You have to understand your audience. Remember, seek first to understand then seek to be understood. And so I'm actually calling upon you to adapt yourself. Um, I don't like one one universal law, you know, one best way. I'm not very big fans of that. I am fans of figure out what the situation is. Who are they? What seems to set them off? Let's not go that way. If, if for, you know, I do that. I'm a, I'm a director of a school. I'm, I'm, it's essentially a kind of a, a, a dean level position. I have uh, departments in advertising, journalism, public relations, radio, television, um, interpersonal communication. So I have all these departments. And what I find is I can't deal with the department heads or the faculty or, or even students all the same way. I have to very quickly learn to say, all right, today I need to do more asking than telling. Uh, tomorrow I may need to do more telling. Um, I think it works for both peers and when you deal with hierarchical situations. Obviously, hierarchy adds a whole other dimension into it in, in, in terms of expectations, um, uh, in terms of interacting together. 
what I think you should do is really try to find the balance of what seems to work in the, in the context and the situations and with the people that you're involved with and treat them as, as real players in it, real, real interaction in terms of doing it. Other questions? I know, you got lunch is waiting, so it's hard to ask for questions here. But after lunch, you're going to be sleepy for whoever's then. So, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. They can't be sleepy. Alfonso oh. is going to have them up and moving around. Well, he is going to prevent you from being sleepy. Good. Well, thank you for the time to be with you guys. I am. Um,